A word to the reader from the author. The history of this world is fast closing. Events are taking place in the physical, political, and spiritual world, which show that we are living in a crisis such as has never been since the creation of this world. The voice of innocent blood crieth from the ground. The nations are angry. Not one nation, but all the nations of the earth look forward with fearful apprehensions to what is coming. The prophet in view of this time exclaims, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. The glorious morning of salvation that will bring deliverance to the people of God, and the night of eternal death to those who reject the repeated warnings given in the word of God. Through John on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord lifts the veil and lets us see the history of the church in its relation to the world. Seven times the prophet exhorts all who have an ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We invite all to a careful perusal of the contents of this book with the prayer that God will impress minds by His Holy Spirit. It is not the design of the writer of the story of the seer of Patmos to arouse discussion and awaken controversy upon theoretical points, but to tell the truth as it is in Jesus. The book is written in a narrative style, and the symbols are explained by the marginal references, so that the reader will readily find a mine of rich treasure in the book. The entire book of Revelation is printed in italics on the margin of the pages together with several thousand other scriptures which throw light on the subject. We earnestly pray that God's blessing may rest upon the readers and that the book may help many to become better acquainted with the book of all books, the Word of the Living God. Yours in the Blessed Hope, S. N. Haskell The the Story of the Seer of Patmos by Stephen N. Haskell Introduction One of the distinguishing features of the age of the world in which we live is the prevalence of light and knowledge. It is but a fulfillment of the divine words. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12 Four. During the preceding century, more than in all the centuries of the past, a flood of light has been shed upon the prophetic page. The seal which metaphorically hid the true meaning of the book of Daniel has been removed by the fulfillment of nearly all its predictions, so that the records of history demonstrate its true meaning. Prophecy is history in advance. History is prophecy fulfilled. When both agree, we have the genuine meaning. Therefore we know we are in the time of the end, and very near its close. The book of Revelation is introduced by the following words. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Revelation 1.1 1, 1. As the book of Daniel reaches to the time of the end, and the book of Revelation contains things which must shortly come to pass before the end, the two books must be companion volumes, closely related to each other. The book of Daniel, in point of time, precedes the book of Revelation upwards of six centuries. In short, the latter is largely an inspired commentary on the former and as such becomes a valuable aid to its correct understanding. Every earnest, intelligent student of prophecy will study these two books together. Each is mutually helpful to the understanding of the other. There is an opinion extant quite prevalent among those skeptically inclined and a class of professed Christians who ignore the whole subject of prophecy, that the book of Revelation is mystical foggy and cannot be understood. If so, the Spirit of God has misnamed it. God says it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation is not something concealed. It is something made known. 
In other words, this blessed book makes known to us the things God wishes us to know. He reveals to us the nature of the events to occur all through the Christian dispensation, and especially those connected with Christ's return to this earth at His second coming. The Revelation is a book of symbols, the representation of mighty kingdoms by the symbols of beasts as given in Daniel and Revelation is common among the nations of the earth. We speak of the British lion, the Russian bear, the American eagle, and every intelligent person understands what is meant, because nations themselves have chosen these creatures to represent them on their flags and standards. Inspiration chooses symbols to represent various nations, and the scriptures themselves plainly define their meaning. There are no books in the Bible of greater interest to the earnest student than the visions of Daniel and John. This volume, The Story of the Seer of Patmos, is a companion volume to the story of Daniel the prophet by the same author. We doubt not that this volume will equal or exceed the former in popularity. The author is a devoted minister of the gospel of long experience, a deep and most earnest student of the Holy Scriptures, and especially conversant with the subject of prophecy. He has given many years of careful study to the subjects contained in this volume. It is written for all classes of readers. The most intelligent professional man can find herein blessed food for thought and precious instruction in the Bible truths for this remarkable age. The businessman can be greatly profited by the perusal of this volume. Men need to have their attention called away from worldly themes to the great things God is about to do in our world. The common people will read this volume with delight. It will open up great fields of thought which they have never before explored, while the Bible student will find in it a rich mine of treasure. The Apostle John was an old man when he wrote the book of Revelation. It was a special revelation from Jesus Christ himself and reveals the order of events commencing in John's time and reaching to Christ's second coming under various heads and series of events, the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the three messages, etc. It ends with the glorious restitution of all things spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Here are themes worthy of the most careful study. The author has made these mysterious symbols so plain that any one who will carefully follow him can understand the book of Revelation. The study of this inspired book of Holy Writ is important. Christ himself says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We are living at the close of the great prophetic periods revealed in Daniel and Revelation. We greatly need the light contained in this volume, we most gladly welcome every additional ray of light shining on our pathway. The perils of the last days are around us. Great changes are occurring. Satanic deceptions abound on every hand. The time has come, foretold by our Savior, when, if it be possible, even the elect are in danger of deception. Matthew 24, 23, and 26. The Revelator speaks of the same things. Let all become intelligent in reference to these things. The story of the seer of Patmos will enlighten all who will read and study it. Our Savior informs us that when the signs of His coming began to come to pass, His people should look up and lift up their heads, for their redemption draweth nigh. Ah, dear reader, do you not desire to be a citizen of that glorious city spoken of in the last chapters of Revelation, with its gates of pearl, streets of gold, wall of jasper, and foundations garnished with precious stones, where the tree of life shall grow, and the river of life flows out from beneath the throne of God, where Christ will ever dwell, where God shall wipe away all tears from the eyes of His people, where death will never come, 
sorrow will never be felt, nor pain evermore exist. Study the blessed revelation, and you will get new and blessed conceptions of these great divine realities. George I. Butler, Nashville, Tennessee, April 24, 1905 The Story of the Seer of Patmos by Stephen N. Haskell Entered according to the Act of Congress in the year 1905 by Stephen N. Haskell in the office of the Librarian of Congress, Washington, D.C. All rights reserved. Author's Preface Prophecy is often considered dark and mysterious. The Lord describes how prophecy given in vision will be looked upon by many people, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. The book of Revelation was never sealed, for the angel said to John, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. God has given the book of Revelation a title different from any other book in the Bible, signifying that it is open to all. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He has pronounced a blessing upon everyone who reads it, or even hears it read. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. It is adapted to every mind, and is full of choice illustrations and symbols, which will not only interest, but instruct the reader. It is a complete book in itself. For John was told, What thou seest, write in a book. He then said that he bare record of the word of God, and of all things that he saw. The prophecies of Revelation cover the period of the time from the first advent of Christ to the earth made new. The history of the Christian church is repeated four times in different figures, illustrating almost every phase of experience the church will pass through. Portions of the history are repeated several times. The book of Revelation opens the portals of the city of God and presents to the readers, Eden restored, with its tree of life bearing twelve manner of fruit. The study of prophecy, by many, is considered uninteresting, and much that is written upon this subject is given in an argumentative style which is unattractive to many minds. The story of the seer of Patmos is a treatise on the book of Revelation, given in a narrative style interesting alike to old and young. The story of the seer of Patmos is sent forth on its mission of love with earnest prayer to God that it may point all who read to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. May the Bible student find treasure, the skeptics find ground for faith, and the thoughtless become acquainted with the thoughts of God by reading this book. May the Lord bless its mission, and in love of the great Master, may it prove a blessing to thousands of souls who are struggling with the conflicts and ills of this life, and guide them to the pearly portals of the New Jerusalem. The Story of the Seer of Patmos Chapter 1 The Seer of Patmos the men whom God has chosen as a means of communication between heaven and earth form a galaxy of noted characters. The gift of prophecy is called the best gift, and the church is exhorted to covet that best gift. To be able to view scenes still future and to talk in the language of heaven requires a closer walk with God than is attained by most men. But through all the ages there have been those whose lives were so in unison with the laws of Jehovah that they became the channel of the Spirit of God. It is not that such men have greater attainments than all others, but they are like the dense cloud 
with its falling raindrops, through which the sun shines to produce the rainbow in its glory. One forgets the cloud while watching the bow of promise. So with the prophet, one loses sight of the instrument through whom God speaks by beholding the glory of the scene which he portrays. But lest the Spirit should be lost in its transmission, the chosen instrument must be purified in the furnace of affliction. Those tests which bring the human soul in touch with the divine are necessary experiences before human eyes can see or human tongues can speak of things yet future. Genesis that condense treaties on the plan of salvation, the work which contains the gospel in embryo, was written in the Midian desert, probably near Mount Horeb, while Moses watched the flocks of Jethro. Every other book in the Bible is but the unfolding of the truths of Genesis. It is the Alpha, and the book of Revelation is the Omega, of the Word of God to man. As God prepared Moses by a life of forty years in the solitudes of Midian, so he called the Apostle John from this society of men, and led him along a strange path upward, and still upward, until at last on the rocky coast of Patmos, heaven was open to his wandering gaze, and the future history of the church was made known. About six hundred years before the advent of Christ, there lived another seer, Daniel. To him God revealed the history of the nations of the world, from his own day when Babylon bore universal sway, until nations should be no more. Daniel was shown the world's history. In connection with the account of the rise and fall of nations, Daniel saw the history of his own people, the Hebrew race, from their captivity in Babylon, until they rejected the anointed of God. Daniel was of the royal seed of Israel, and was prime minister in the court of Babylon, during the years when this history was revealed to him. He of all men was fitted by education and position to write the history of the world. As foretold by ancient prophets, the Savior became a servant of men, he was anointed at the very time predicted by the prophet Daniel. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and, lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Standing on the banks of the Jordan, a witness to this anointing, was a young man chosen of heaven to continue the history begun by Daniel. The Hebrew prophet Daniel was in the schools of Chaldea three years, during which time God revealed to the wise men of Babylon the superiority of the wisdom of God over all the learning of the world. While in that school, Daniel received the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John the fisherman, the first of Christ's disciples, spent three years at the side of the master teacher, receiving such instruction as fitted him in spiritual things to become a leader of nations. Daniel will stand in his lot in the latter days, by his prophecies revealing the time of the end. John, according to the words of Christ, will by his prophecies tarry until the coming of the Savior in the clouds of heaven. For when in answer to Peter's question, Concerning the future of the beloved disciple, Jesus said, If I will that he tarry till I come, he revealed the prophetic mission of that disciple. The Savior saw him on Patmos, receiving the revelation. The prophecy as given to John is a revelation of Jesus Christ, and is the history of God's dealings with the church, which bears the name Christian. Daniel is a history of nations, the revelation is ecclesiastical history, and into it nations are introduced only when they affect the growth of the church. The life of Daniel shows how God can work through men in high positions. The preparation of John for his work as a prophet is the story of the transformation wrought in the heart of a fisherman by the Spirit of God. The extremes of society were represented by these two men. 
The story of each life is the narration of the events of a life in which love worked and is an object lesson of the development of Christian character. In the town of Bethsaida, on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee, lived the fisherman Zebedee with his wife Salome and two sons, James and John. The two young men were partners with their father in his business and were accustomed to the toil and hardships of a fisherman's life. A spirit of piety characterized the home, for beneath the rough exterior was a desire to understand the word of God. The promise of the Messiah had been read, and when it was known that the prophet of the wilderness was preaching and baptizing at Enon and proclaiming the advent of Christ, the younger son of Zebedee, in company with Andrew of Bethsaida, sought baptism. It was there that they witnessed the anointing and heard the Baptist's words, Behold, the Lamb of God. John and Andrew were the two disciples who followed after Christ and to whom he turned, saying, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And when he led them to the place where he abode, they talked with him, they believed, and the nucleus of the Christian church was formed. Christ, the center, the life, drew John, and the young man's heart responded to the quickening touch. This was the beginning of a new life, a soul communion. Andrew, too, was convinced of the divinity of Christ, but Andrew represents those who accept because the mind is convinced of truth. He sought it once for his brother Peter, saying, We have found the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed. And when Peter came to Christ, he was convinced of the divine nature of Jesus, because the Savior read his character and gave him a name in accord with Peter's nature. But John represents those of the inner circle of discipleship. He was won by love, not argument. His heart was held by love, and the whole theme of all his writings is love. He saw only love in Christ, and he responded freely to that wondrous drawing power. It was like an electric current flowing from Christ, and John desired to be ever in the circuit. He kept close to Jesus, walked hand in hand with him, sat next to him at the table, lay on his bosom. He was that disciple whom Jesus loved. As long as John kept in touch with the divine life of the Master, there was nothing in his life out of harmony with the Savior. That there were times when the harmony was broken is true, and this was due to the fact that the human in John had not yet been subdued. The human channel through which the Spirit flowed sometimes arrested the flow. This was the case when James and John asked to sit, one on the left and the other on the right of the throne in the new kingdom. Christ recognized the desire as a result of more than human affection, and so in place of a rebuke, he attempted only to deepen and purify that love. The entire life of John tended to cleanse the soul temple and to prepare him for his final work. The union between the soul of Christ and John is shown by numerous incidents. During the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, John sought him out, longing to go with him. But Christ bade John return, for he did not wish the young man to witness the fierce struggles with the prince of darkness. When not allowed to remain as companion in the wilderness, he sought out Mary of Nazareth, who was in doubt as to the whereabouts of her son. Sitting by the side of the lonely mother, John related the story of Christ's baptism and told her of his present condition. He won his way into the heart of the family, as well as into the heart of Jesus. This explains why the Savior, when hanging on the cross, gave directions for John to make a home for this same mother. Such gentleness was not altogether natural with the sons of Zebedee, for when they first became Christ's followers, he called James and John Boanerges, sons of thunder. They possessed an ambitious, hasty, outspoken spirit, which was subdued by association with the Savior. 
the natural inclinations were replaced by contrition, faith, and love. John especially yielded to that power of the Christ. Every experience of this disciple pointed unmistakably to the crowning work of his life. When the Savior had returned to heaven, John would become the medium of communication between God and man. He was not the only prophet of the apostolic church, for sixteen others are named in the New Testament, but to him was given the most extended view of the future work of God in the earth. Bearing in mind that the eye of heaven was upon John, and that he was in every act preparing for that noblest of callings, although he knew it not, the history of this disciple becomes a wonderful object lesson to those who live in the end of time. He yielded himself fully to the teachings of the man of God. His mind met the mind of Christ. His soul touched the soul of the Divine One. Life flowed from Christ, begetting life in the disciples. This is Christian experience. This will be the experience of all who live to see the Savior coming in the clouds of heaven. And this experience enabled John to say, Of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. The growth in grace was a gradual development, and at times an unholy zeal overmastered the tenderness which Christ constantly sought to impart. There was one man who cast out devils, and John rebuked him because this man was not like the disciples a follower of the Savior. This spirit of judging all others by a self-reared standard was rebuked in the words of the Master. Forbid them not. When the Samaritans offered insult to the Savior, John was the one who wished to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. He was surprised when the Savior revealed to him the fact that such a spirit was one of persecution, and that he, the Son of God, had not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Each correction was keenly felt, but it opened to the mind of John the principle of divine government, and revealed to him the depth of divine love. Near the close of Christ's ministry, the mother of James and John came to ask for her sons the place of honor in his kingdom. Salome herself was a follower of Christ, and the great love of the family for the Savior led them all to desire to be near him. Love always draws us near to the object of our love. Jesus saw what the granting of the request would imply, and in tones of sadness answered, that the place nearest the throne would be occupied by those who endured most, who sacrificed most, and who loved most. In later life, John comprehended the meaning of the answer, for he was given a view of the redeemed, as they will gather on the sea of glass about the throne. These human desires came at times when the life current was partially broken. At other times its flow was steady and strong. Thus it was when John stood with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration and heard the voices of Moses and Elijah as they sought to strengthen the Savior for his soon coming death. John sat at the Savior's left hand at the Passion Supper, and as the little company of twelve walked in the moonlight toward Olivet on that last night, John pressed close to the Savior's side as they entered the Garden of Gethsemane, eight of the disciples remained without the gate, while Peter, James, and John went on a little farther. The Son of Man longed to have John sit beside him during that bitter struggle, and although John had lived so near to Jesus, yet he failed to grasp that last opportunity which would have placed him next to the throne. While the Savior pleaded in agony, and finally fell, Fainting to the ground, John was sleeping. The flesh was weak, although the spirit was willing. His love, so fervent, was still weakened by the clay channel through which it flowed. Still more bitter trials were needed to burn out all the dross. Having slept, he too fled when the mob came for the Savior. But his love drew him back. 
ashamed of his cowardice, he returned and entered the judgment hall, keeping close to the man condemned as a criminal. All night long he watched and prayed, and hoped soon to see a flash of divinity, which would forever silence the accusers. He followed to Calvary. Every nail that was driven seemed to tear his own flesh. Faint he turned away, but came back to support the mother of Jesus, who stood at the foot of the cross. That dying cry pierced to his very heart. The one whom he had loved was dead. Unable to comprehend the meaning of it all, yet he helped prepare the body for burial, and with the other sorrowing disciples passed a lonely Sabbath. Life seemed scarcely worth living, for he for whom they had given up everything, and whom they had believed to be the Son of God, was silent in death. The words which Christ had spoken concerning his own death, and which John should have understood, had fallen on deaf ears. Much as he loved his Lord, he was dull of hearing. On the morning of the resurrection, John was the first of the twelve to reach the tomb, for he outran Peter when Mary Magdalene reported that the body was gone. Seeing the folded napkin in the sepulchre, he recognized the familiar touch of a risen Savior and believed. On the evening after the resurrection, John received the benediction when Christ appeared. But since he could no longer see his master with the physical eye, he returned to his fishing on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus sought him again, and bade him go forth a fisher of men. In the last recorded interview between Christ and his disciples, the Savior prophetically gave the work of Peter and John. Those two earnest followers, who had passed through so many clouds, and yet had seen such bright rays of sunlight. Peter was told it would be his lot to follow his Lord to the cross. When he asked the fate of John, Christ replied, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? The life of John is but briefly referred to after the ascension. He remained in Jerusalem for a number of years, and was known as one of the pillars of that church as late as A.D. 58. John's fervent love for the Savior grew stronger as he suffered oppression and imprisonment. His own brother, James, was among the first martyrs to the cause of Christianity. Living as John did at the center of the work, he witnessed the spread of the truth and knew of its triumphs as well as its vicissitudes. Roman oppression became greater, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the army of Titus, and John was banished to the Isle of Patmos. He himself says that he was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is a beautiful thought that he whose heart was so bound up in Jerusalem and the Hebrew race, and who was always so true to both, should have been permitted to see the glories of the new Jerusalem the city finally to take the place of his own earthly Zion. To him was given the entire history of the church of God, which must do the work rejected by his own race. The road from the Jordan to the rocky height of Patmos was a steep and stony way, but when he sat alone upon the mountainside, overlooking the sea, the intense love, the soul union with Christ, which those previous years had developed, enabled that disciple whom Jesus loved to become the connecting link between heaven and earth. Gabriel, Christ's own angel, stood by the side of the last survivor of the chosen twelve and opened to his vision the glories of the future. A nature less spiritual would have failed to grasp the picture of eternity. A mind less consecrated would not have been the channel for such a flood of divine enlightenment. In the Midian desert, where none but God was near, Moses wrote Genesis, the Alpha of all things. John wrote Revelation, the complete unfolding of that first book, the Omega, when alone on an island in the midst of the sea. The pen of him who wrote the history of creation was guided by the same angel who bore to John the heavenly message concerning the consummation of the plan of redemption. 
Moses recorded the story of creation and the fall, and by faith he grasped the promise of a Redeemer. John lived with that Redeemer, and as he stood on Patmos, he looked back into the past, to the place where Moses stood on Pisgah, and then forward to the city of God, which he saw descending on the Mount of Olives. The two mountain peaks from which all history can be viewed are Genesis and Revelation, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. John the Beloved, a poem. I'm growing very old, this weary head that has so often leaned on Jesus' breast, in days long past that seem almost a dream, is bent and hoary with its weight of years. These limbs that followed him, my master oft, from Galilee to Judah, yea, that stood beneath the cross and trembled with his groans, refused to bear me even through the streets to preach unto my children. E'en my lips refused to form the words my heart sends forth. My ears are dull, they scarcely hear the sobs of my dear children gathered round my couch. God lays his hand upon me, yea, his hand, and not his rod. The gentle hand that I felt those three years so often pressed in mine, in friendship such as passeth woman's love. I'm old, so old I cannot recollect the faces of my friends, and I forget the words and deeds that make my daily life. But that dear face and every word he spoke grow more distinct as others fade away, so that I live with him and wholly dead more than with the living. Some seventy years ago I was a fisher by the sacred sea. It was at sunset. How the tranquil tide bathed dreamily the pebbles. How the light crept up the distant hills, and in its wake soft purple shadows wrapped the dewy fields. And then he came and called me. Then I gazed for the first time on that sweet face, those eyes from out of which as from a window shone, divinity looked on my inmost soul and lighted it forever. Then his words broke on the silence of my heart and made the whole world musical. Incarnate love took hold of me and claimed me for its own. I followed in the twilight, holding fast his mantle. Oh, what holy walks we had! through harvest fields and desolate, dreary wastes. And oftentimes he leaned upon my arm, wearied and wayworn. I was young and strong, and so upbore him. Lord, now I am weak and old and feeble. Let me rest on thee. So put thine arm around me, closer still. How strong thou art! The twilight grows apace. Come, let us leave these noisy streets and take the path to Bethany, for Mary's smile awaits us at the gate, and Martha's hands have long prepared the cheerful evening meal. Come, James, the master waits, and Peter C. has gone some steps before. What say you, friends, that this is Ephesus, and Christ is gone back to his kingdom? Aye, tis so, tis so. I know it all, and yet... Just now I seem to stand once more upon my native hills and touch my master. Oh, how oft I've seen the touching of his garment bring back strength to palsied limbs. I feel it has to mine. Up, bear me once more to my church. Once more. There, let me tell them of a Savior's love. For by the sweetness of my master's voice, just now I think he must be very near. Coming, I trust, to break the veil, which time has worn so thin that I can see beyond and watch his footsteps. So raise my head. How dark it is. I cannot seem to see the faces of my flock. Is that the sea that murmurs so, or is it weeping? Hush, my little children. God so loved the world, he gave his Son. So love ye one another. Love God and man. Amen. Now, bear me back. 
My legacy unto an angry world is this. I feel my work is finished. Are the streets so full? What call the folk my name? The Holy John? Nay, write me rather Jesus Christ's beloved and lover of my children. Lay me down once more upon my couch and open wide the eastern window. See, there comes a light like that which broke upon my soul at eve when in the dreary isle of patmos gabriel came and touched me on the shoulder see it grows as when we mounted toward the pearly gates i know the way i trod it once before and hark it is the song the ransom sang of glory to the lamb how loud it sounds and that unwritten one methinks my soul can join it now O oh, my Lord, my Lord, how bright thou art, and yet the very same I loved in Galilee. Tis worthy the hundred years to feel this bliss. So lift me up, dear Lord, unto thy bosom, there shall I abide. The Story of the Seer of Patmos Chapter 2 The Author of the Revelation the first chapter of Revelation is an introduction to the entire book. The first three verses are a preface to the chapter, and the first verse is the key, not only to Revelation, but to every prophetic book in the Bible, showing how all prophecy is given. In this first verse is given the title of the book, the author of the prophecy, its object, the manner in which it came, and the agent of God in making known the history of future events. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not the revelation of John, as many seem to think. For then it would cease to be prophecy, and as a history would rank no higher than the works of many other writers. John calls himself our brother and companion in tribulation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, an unfolding of the life of the God-man. Jesus means Savior, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus was the name given by the angel when he talked with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Christ means anointed. Jesus Christ is the anointed Savior. Prophets of old have foretold of his mission on earth and named him Emmanuel, God with us. To John, then, was laid open or made manifest the mystery of Emmanuel, the union of the divine and human, the Christ. The entire book of Revelation is an explanation of the divine life, which God placed in the human mold and gave to man for all eternity. Divinity needed humanity, for it required both the divine and the human to bring salvation to the world. Divinity needed humanity that humanity might afford a channel of communication between God and man. Humanity was lost without divinity. Salvation came by the union of the two in Christ. The union formed in him will never be severed, for the church to which his teachings gave birth is a child of God, and the history of the church is the history of Emmanuel, the mystery of godliness. Adam was made in the image of God and was a son of God. But sin severed the tie, and the children of Adam were born in sin. But Christ, the second Adam, was the Son of God, and the Church, the only begotten of Christ, partakes of the nature of the Father and stands before the world to perpetuate His name, Emmanuel. This family name will never become extinct. I, Paul, Bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The continued history of Emmanuel, as read in the life of the Christian Church, is what was revealed to John by the angel Gabriel, Christ's attendant, that member of the heavenly host, whose duty it has long been to make known the mystery of God to his servants. God desires that man should comprehend the nature of his law, and the manner of his working. Near the close of the first century, Gabriel was bidden 
to open to the prophet on Patmos the signs or symbols by which John might understand the history of the work of God in the earth. God reveals himself to man in various ways. Nature is the mirror of divinity. The word of God is his character in human language. Christ was that word lived in human form. And the body of Christ, the church, has in addition to these methods the providences or leadings of the Spirit. Thus, John bare record of the word of God, as written and as lived in Christ. And he bare record also of the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. And he likewise bare record of the signs which Gabriel presented to his vision, the all things that he saw. A heavenly benediction is pronounced upon him that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and upon those who keep those things which are written therein. It must needs be that the things written by John can be understood, else why the blessing that is here pronounced? Since the book is a revelation of Jesus Christ to the servants of the Most High, all who are his servants will study and understand the prophecy. Every doctrine necessary for salvation was given in the revelation of Christ, and the book becomes a compendium of the whole Bible. The blessing pronounced upon the servants to whom it is sent is an eternal blessing. For thou blessest, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. John, while on the island, away from the work with which he had been so long and so intimately associated, away from friends and companions, often let his mind wander to the scene of his former labors. As he looked toward the shores of Asia Minor, there came up before him the picture of the companies of believers who were standing for the truth in the midst of pagan darkness. He loved those followers of his Lord, and through him Christ sent a message to each of the seven churches which are in Asia. The Spirit used each of those churches to represent a period in the history of the work of God on earth. The seven covering the time from the life of John to the closing events in the history of the world. There was a peculiar significance in the location of these seven churches. Asia Minor, or more particularly the western portion of the peninsula, to which the term Asia is applied in Revelation 1-4, held in the spread of Christianity, a position corresponding to that which was occupied by Palestine in the history of the Jewish nation. When God wished to make the Hebrew race the leading government of earth, he chose for the seat of that government a position unrivaled by any other portion of the globe. Palestine was the highway between the south and the east, and between the east and the west. When the power of God passed from this nation to the Christian church, Asia Minor became the center of activity and the base of operation. In those seacoast towns, and in Ephesus, above all others, Jew and Gentile met on equal footing. Every nationality, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, representing the far north and east, met in trade, with citizens of Rome, Egypt, and Cyrene, men from the south and the west. Into these busy marts the Christian faith penetrated, and from these centers the knowledge of the Christ was spread to all the world. Jehovah, the great I Am, who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, the Father of us all, who meets us where we are, He, the ever-present, breathing His blessing on the church, called by the name of His Son. And from the seven spirits which are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, the visible manifestation of that Spirit, came the greeting of grace and peace to the companies who should be known by the name of the anointed. Here is inscribed the name of the author of the revelation. He who today witnesses for us in the heavenly court is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. And above all, he is the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He who on earth was the despised and rejected of men, was in truth the prince of the kings of the earth. 
again and again this same Christ had by his providences caused men to acknowledge the fact that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. No ruler on earth reigns independent of the Lord of heaven, for all power belongs unto God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. For this reason men are exhorted to pray for governors and kings, that there may be peace in the land. Here is the position to which he calls us. He hath made us kings to sit on thrones and rule, and priests to minister unto God and his Father. And yet when on earth he had said, He that is greatest among you, let him be as he that doth serve. The joint heirs with Christ rule while still on earth, but their authority here is by virtue of the power of an endless life, and they are leaders not in a physical sense, but in the spiritual realm. The scepter that they sway is not carnal and temporal, but eternal. The position is above earthly potentates, and the wonderful part of it all is that in the world which is in the hands of the prince of evil, Christ has a nation of kings and priests, a kingdom within a kingdom. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The eye of the prophet swept over the company, and as he saw the power of the gospel, in ecstasy he exclaimed, To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. He saw in one glance the closing of earth's history, the coming of the Son of Man with power and great glory. He saw again that angry crowd who gathered in the garden of Gethsemane and rudely bore away his master. He saw the jeering company about the cross and the soldier who pierced his side. But as he watches this time, he hears the bitter wail of those who rejected the Savior of mankind. And as he looked, he heard the words, I am Alpha, the beginning, and Omega, the ending, the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. This expression, or its equivalent, occurs four times in this first chapter. The Sabbath was a precious day to John, and it had been especially dear since that never-to-be-forgotten Sabbath on which their master rested in the tomb. The preparation for that Sabbath was the bitter hours on Calvary. The day itself was one of utter loneliness, because the gospel of the resurrection was not comprehended. It should have been a day of joy. It was intended as such, and after the Savior came from the grave, and the light of his countenance again rested upon his followers, they saw more clearly than ever before that the Sabbath was not only a reminder of creation, but that it also commemorated redemption. It became the central truth in giving the life of Christ. To John on Patmos it was a day of holy joy. The Savior came divinely near, and as John contemplated scenes in his own association with Christ, the man of God, his heart warmed with praise. In imagination he stood by Jordan and saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the pained face of the Master as they sat around the table on that last night. An agony of feeling passed over him as he recalled the trial, the condemnation, and the death. But it was replaced by the joy of the resurrection and the remembrance of those last words as the clouds caught him from the sight of men. John's love for Christ was so strong that it seemed his master must surely speak to him again. And he heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet, and Christ, his own Christ, stood by his side. I am the first, but I am also the last. I am Alpha and Omega. Write what thou seest in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. He spoke in trumpet tones, like the clearest music, and the voice was as the sound of many waters. But still, to John, he was the same Jesus, whom he had known in Galilee and in Jerusalem, not now despised, mocked, and rejected, 
but standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the churches, their light being the reflection of his own. He was clothed, not in the cast-off purple robe, but in a garment of righteousness, of dazzling whiteness, and girt about the loins with the golden girdle of truth. The purity of God himself encircled his brow with a halo of light, for his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. The white hairs which in old age are a crown of glory, even in the presence of sin and decay, are a token of salvation through a Savior's love. The power of the life within shone through his eyes as a flame of fire, and the character is still further portrayed in the fact that his feet glowed like unto the most brilliant metal, purified seven times. His footsteps were attended by light and heat, and his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun. The shining of our sun is a figure of the light of God, shining in the face of Jesus Christ. In human beings, the light of the eye betrays the inner life, and a man's countenance doth witness against him. Thus, in every detail of John's description is revealed the depth of spirituality, the power of the God of life. Although this is a description of the personal appearance of Christ, it portrays his character as well. Those who continue to reveal God in the earth must, through the merits of Christ, manifest the same character as living epistles known and read of all men. The robe of his righteousness must cover the human frailties and imperfections. The truth of God must be the rule of life. Cleansed by the blood of Christ, the sinner becomes as white as snow. As he was made perfect through suffering, so the church will be purified by the fires of affliction. They will be brethren with John, companions in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He who spoke to John was the one who commanded, and world stood forth in space. Christ now stood beside John, and the prophet, looking upon his glory, fell at his feet as one dead. He had walked with him and talked with him, with this same man, Christ Jesus. When he was on earth, he had asked to sit by his side in his kingdom. The glory of his presence now overcame John. But Jesus laid his right hand on him, that hand which had so often rested there before, and in a voice which John recognized as the same with which the Master spoke to the stormy waves of Galilee, he said, Be not afraid. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. You saw me in the grave, but I now have the keys of hell and of death. And so the message which John was commanded to give unto the churches is a message of triumph over sin, over death and the grave. It is the victory of truth over error. Christ appeared walking in the midst of the candlesticks, which symbolized the churches. And he held in his hand the seven stars, or angels, which direct the work of the churches and which are light-bearers from his throne to those who represent the work of heaven on earth. God looks upon the Christian church as he looked upon Christ in the days of his sojourn on earth. As he was attended by an angel, so the church is guided by the Spirit of God and by the testimony of that Spirit. In days of triumph, the angel attendants sing the song which filled the plains of Bethlehem on the night of the birth of Jesus. In days of persecution, trials, and despondency, angels lift the weary heads as Gabriel ministered to Christ in the wilderness and in Gethsemane. The church completes the work begun by Christ in the flesh. His life studied will give the history of the church. His life as recorded in the revelation of Jesus Christ is but a further unfolding of that same mystery of the Incarnation, the Emmanuel. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein.
The Story of the Seer of Patmos Chapter 3 The Message to the Churches Ephesus The Message to the Seven Churches covers a period in ecclesiastical history extending from the time of Christ's first advent to His second coming. To John, Christ appeared walking in the midst of the churches, the candlesticks, and it is a most beautiful truth that the divine presence has never been withdrawn from the earth. One of the last promises made by Christ to his disciples was, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And it matters not how torn or scattered his people may have been. That promise, reverberating from age to age, has been the comfort and solace of each individual Christian and of the church as a body. Heaven looks upon the earth as one vast mission field, and the church is a beacon of light in the midst of darkness. The incarnation of Christ drew the sympathies of all the universe earthward, and the whole creation groaneth, waiting for our adoption. Christ, attended by the host of heaven, his ministering spirits, is always found in the midst of the church. And he that toucheth the church, toucheth the apple of the eye of Christ. The first message which John was bidden to deliver was to the church of Ephesus. There were other churches in Asia Minor, but there were reasons why Ephesus was first addressed and why it should be taken to represent the church in general during the first years of its existence. The word Ephesus means first or desirable. In the first century, Ephesus was the capital of Asia Minor and the center of trade from both the east and the west. It was strongly under Greek influence and in position corresponded to Corinth in Greece and Alexandria in Egypt. It has been called the rallying place of paganism and was a stronghold of the recognized religion and the popular education of the world, when soon after the death of the Savior it was first visited by the apostles. It may well be taken to symbolize that period of ecclesiastical history when the gospel in its purity met in open conflict the darkest forms of pagan worship. Side by side with the Greeks dwelt Jews, men who ought to have held aloft the worship of Jehovah, but who had lost the spirit by mingling with the idol worshippers. It was into this city, restless and turbulent, and easily wrought upon, that Paul as a missionary went to preach of a risen Savior. He met with difficulties, opposed on one side by science, falsely so called, and on the other side by a religion which had the form of godliness, but which had lost the power thereof, Paul offered the crucified Son of God. Miracles attended his preaching. In the synagogue of the Jews, he reasoned three months concerning the kingdom of God. And when men hardened their hearts against the word, he entered the school of Tyrannus, where he taught for two years, with such power that the word of the Lord Jesus went abroad throughout all Asia, among both Jews and Greeks. The Greeks were scholars and exalted the power of intellectual culture. Paul, as a Christian missionary, first taught in the synagogue, then in the schools where the gospel of Jesus Christ was offered in place of the philosophy of Plato, whom the Greeks deified. Said he, The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So powerful was this teaching of the Apostle, that many who own books of sorcery or magic, which pass for wisdom in the eyes of the world, brought their books, and burned them before all men. Students from this school of Tyrannus became earnest workers in Asia Minor, and through them the gospel was made known. Not only was the learning of the Greeks, who were the intellectual lights of the world, opposed by Paul and his disciples, but the trades were affected. 
so much so that there was an uprising of the people, who with one voice cried, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana, the patron goddess of Ephesus, was a personification of fecundity. In this city, Christianity, the power of God unto salvation, came in open and bitter conflict with the false religion and the false education of the world. He who walked among the churches watched the light of the torch of truth in Ephesus, and so the first words addressed to the church are, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. Those who on the day of Pentecost received the baptism of the Spirit, and those who heard the gospel from their lips, were filled with a burning desire to spread the news of a Savior. They were married unto Christ, and in the ardor of their first love, the converts sought for their friends and relatives, pleading with them to forsake evil and to accept salvation. There was no work too arduous, no journey too difficult to be undertaken for him whom they loved. It can be seen that the power of God and the power of evil were in each other's grasp. By the side of pagan temples were erected Christian churches. Christian schools sprang up in the very shadow of the Greek institutions of learning. In spite of the power of the enemy, the spread of truth was rapid, so rapid indeed that paganism trembled for its life. Among the converts to the new doctrine were some who were convinced of the truth, but who failed to experience the change of heart which comes with the new birth. There were others who for policy's sake sought fellowship with the Christians, but as long as the church maintained a close connection with God, a clear and distinct line separated believers from impostors. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. The power which attended even the common converts and their ready spirit of discernment is seen in the case of Priscilla and Aquila. When Apollos, who received the gospel, or at least a part of it, in Alexandria, came to Ephesus, Apollos was fervent in the spirit and taught with power, for he was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, but he knew only of the baptism of John. When he preached in the hearing of those with whom Paul abode in Corinth, and who had studied with the great apostle, Aquila and Priscilla detected his ignorance of the outpouring of the Spirit, and the eloquent man received instruction from those who had recently come into the truth. One can in imagination picture the sacrifice which seems necessary on the part of those who accepted Christ in this central stronghold of paganism. Light and darkness met face to face, and paganism made a desperate struggle for existence. It is for these reasons that the first message addressed to Ephesus is applicable to the first era of the Christian religion. Into the darkness of the worst forms of heathenism, the religion and culture of the Greeks, backed by the government of Rome, Christianity walked as a spotless virgin clothed in white. By preaching and by teaching, two methods which are divinely ordained for the spread of the truth, Paul and his fellow laborers raised up a church at Ephesus. John had known of the work at this place, for he as a pillar in the Jerusalem church was acquainted with the progress of the light as it spread from that center and from Patmos his heart turned to the believers on the mainland. The angel said, Unto the church of Ephesus write, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. The message is sent by the one who in heaven holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. God himself had watched each soul as it had separated from the world and linked itself with Christ. The power of Christ himself attended the spread of the gospel in those early days, for it was carried by men who had received of the Pentecostal showers. Christianity was a strange power, as viewed by the heathen, for there were no idols, no outward forms, only a spiritual worship which they could not comprehend. 
the kingdom of Christ was invading the realm of the enemy, and there were no weapons which could attack it. In the space of thirty years, the gospel went to every creature under heaven. Rich and poor alike heard the glad tidings of the desire of all nations, who had been born in Judea. Caesar ruled with unlimited power at Rome. No hand was raised against the throne, and yet Christianity crept within those palace walls, and Paul preached to some of Nero's household. This growth is recognized in the message, Thou hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. This was the experience of the first century of the Christian religion. The power by which it grew was that of love, the first love, which in its ardor knew no bounds. It was the love of which Paul writes when he says, That love is the fulfilling of the law. Christ watched over the believers with the joy of a bridegroom, and they in return gave him their heart's devotion. There were many among the pagans who, listening to Paul, were convinced of the truth in their minds, but retained their Greek manner of reasoning. Indeed, they applied to the Scriptures the same interpretation which they had formerly placed upon their own Greek writings. These converted Greek philosophers stood side by side with the simple gospel teachers, and in trying to refute paganism by argument, Christianity was in danger of weakening. The shadow of the enemy was falling upon the church. God called after these first believers, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. The Nicolaitans, referred to in verse 6, are said by Moshim to have been a branch of the Gnostics, a sect living in Asia, who denied the divinity of Christ, and boasted of their being able to restore to mankind the knowledge of the true and supreme being. Their belief concerning the creation of the world conflicted with the writings of Moses, and led to a denial of the divine authority of the Old Testament. Still other beliefs, contrary to the teachings of Christ, the result of a mixture of Greek and Oriental philosophy, led to practices which the Church of Christ could not tolerate. He does not say they hated the presence of the Nicolaitans, and could not endure them, but that they hated their deeds, which I also hate. This church was in a position where they could hate the sin and not the sinner, where they could have patience and labor long for the erring and love them, while they hated the deeds that separated them from the Lord. The Lord closes with a message to everyone. He that hath an ear, let him hear. The message comes to all ages in all time, to everyone who receives the gift of hearing. It is the Spirit of God speaking to the church. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Adam was overcome by Satan, and thus lost his right to the tree of life. But to every son of Adam the message comes, I give to eat of the tree of life. It is the privilege of every child of God to claim the victory, and to overcome every attack of the enemy through the strength given by Christ. To the tree of life, the faithful are promised access, in contradistinction to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life was transplanted from the Garden of Eden to heaven, but its boughs hang over the wall for all who will reach upward for its fruit. As the experience of the church is applicable to each denomination, to each organization, and to each individual, so to the end of time Christians will be placed in positions where they must choose between the wisdom of God and the philosophy of the world, the wisdom which is pure, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good fruits, and the philosophy which, if adhered to, brings loss of light and eventually death. Smyrna Smyrna, the second church addressed, was only about fifty miles from Ephesus, and doubtless knew of the conditions of the central church of Asia Minor. 
But as it was not a great trade center, many of the perplexities with which Ephesus had to contend were not present in Smyrna. Its members were poor, but still they worked earnestly for others. The wealth of Ephesus was one of the greatest drawbacks to the spirituality of that church. But Smyrna, though poor in worldly goods, was rich in the eyes of the Lord. Through false teachers, claiming to be the children of God, persecution came to those who wished to follow the teachings of Christ. The true Jew is an heir by faith of the inheritance promised to Abraham. But many pride themselves on the inheritance of the flesh. Such belong to the synagogue of Satan. For righteousness by works is the devil's counterfeit of the Lord's plan of salvation through faith alone in the merits of the Son of God. The words written by Paul in his letter to the Galatians, who had this same false teaching to meet, makes clear the difference between those who are children of promise and those who are Jews in name only. Paul illustrates the truth by repeating the life experience of Abraham. Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian bondwoman, represents in allegory those who hope to obtain righteousness by their own efforts. Such are the Jews against whom the church at Smyrna was warned. Isaac, the son of Sarah and Abraham, was the child of promise and represents those who accept Christ by faith. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. So to the Smyrna church God said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The message was signed by him which was dead and is alive. Christ's sacrifice of life and his victory over death was pointed to by Gabriel as a special lesson and source of encouragement to those followers who would be called to pass through the fire of persecution. By faith the martyrs could see the crown of eternal life held out to them by the Son of God. The message came to Smyrna, a church in Asia Minor, and likewise to the Christian church as a whole. During the second and third centuries, it was a time when paganism was making its final stand for supremacy in the world. Christianity had spread with wonderful rapidity until it was known throughout the world. Some embraced the faith of Christ because of heart conversion, others because of the might of argument brought to bear, and still others because they could see that the cause of paganism was waning, and policy led them to the side that promised to be victorious. These conditions weakened the spirituality of the church. The spirit of prophecy which characterized the apostolic church, was gradually lost. This is a gift which brings the church to which it is entrusted into the unity of the faith. When there were no longer true prophets, false teachings spread rapidly. The philosophy of the Greeks led to a false interpretation of the scriptures, and the self-righteousness of the ancient Pharisees, so often condemned by Christ, again appeared in the midst of the church. The foundation was laid during the two centuries preceding the reign of Constantine, for those evils which were fully developed during the two centuries following. During this period, martyrdom became popular in many parts of the Roman Empire. Strange as this may seem, it is nonetheless true. It was the result of the relationship existing between Christians and pagans. In the Roman world, the religion of all nations was respected. But the Christians were not a nation. They were but a sect of a despised race. When they therefore persisted in denouncing the religion of all classes of men, when they held secret meetings and separated themselves entirely from the customs and practices of their nearest relatives and most intimate friends, they became objects of suspicion and often of persecution by the pagan authorities. Often they brought persecution upon themselves when there was no spirit of opposition in the minds of the rulers. 
In illustration of this spirit, history gives the details of the execution of Cyprian, bishop of Carthage. When his sentence was read, a general cry arose from the listening multitude of Christians, who said, We will die with him. The spirit with which many professed Christians accepted death, and even needlessly provoked the enmity of the government, probably had much to do with the passage in 303 A.D. of the Edict of Persecution by the Emperor Diocletian and his assistant Galerius. The edict was universal in its spirit and was enforced with more or less strenuousness for ten years. Many Christians suffered death. The sacrifice of a child of God opens afresh the wound made in the Father's heart when Christ was slain. The death of Christ was a sign of separation from sin, on the part of him who accepted the sacrifice. Like the smoke from the altar of incense in the sanctuary service, a life given for the Savior becomes a sweet savor in the sight of Jehovah. Smyrna means myrrh, or sweet scent. This name is applied to those who willingly offer their lives for their faith. The mercy of God is shown in this message in a most wonderful way. For although some doubtless suffered needlessly and brought persecution upon themselves, yet God does not condemn them for mistaken zeal. This is a message that contains no reproof, and it would seem that the tenderness of our Father causes him to lose sight of the fact that death was sought, because he sees the earnestness in the heart of the one who offers his life. It is the same in individual experience. The overzealous oft-times suffer when there is no need of suffering, and yet God reads the motive of the heart and measures out the reward in accordance with what he finds there. Fellow men may criticize and condemn, but God accepts any sacrifice made in his name, and he says to such a follower as he did to King David, Thou didst well that it was in thine heart. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. The second death is the only death that the people of God need to fear. Satan may bring physical death to the faithful followers of Christ, but they will be shielded from the second death. God's people will rejoice in life everlasting while the decree of the second death will be passed upon Satan and his emissaries. The Smyrna church immediately followed the time of Christ and his disciples and was often referred to prophetically in their teachings. Pergamus The condition of Christianity for two or more centuries following the accession of Constantine the Great to the Roman throne may be learned from the message delivered to the church of Pergamus. The ten years' persecution which took place during the reign of Diocletian failed to accomplish the design of its instigator, and a wonderful reaction followed. Constantine, wishing to gain favor above the very men who were foremost in the opposition to Christianity, espoused the cause of that despised sect. And through him, Christianity was raised to the throne of Rome. Pergamus means exaltation or elevation, and it was when nominal Christianity became popular and swayed the civil government that the two-edged sword of the word was necessary to separate between the true and the false. Naturally, the number of converts increased rapidly, and church buildings multiplied. Officers in the church, under favor of the government, spread themselves like the green bay tree. The doctrine of him who said, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant, was reversed, and the papal hierarchy grew apace. This was peculiarly true of the Roman see. Other dioceses attempted the same exaltation. Constantinople, Jerusalem, Ephesus, and Alexandria all contended for supremacy. But Rome, the seat of the dragon, was finally the acknowledged head of the Christian church. God watched the church as it trod this dangerous path to worldly exaltation, and to Pergamus he sent this message, I have a few things against thee, 
because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. During the period of ecclesiastical history, when the message to Pergamus is applicable, the church was guilty of idolatry and fornication. Lest Christians should misunderstand the application and be led to deny the charge, the Spirit of God cites them to the experience of Balaam with Balak, the king of the Moabites, at a time when Israel was about to enter the Promised Land. The following quoted paragraphs throw light on the work of Balaam in teaching Balak to cast a stumbling block before Israel. Balaam was once a good man and a prophet of God, but he had apostatized and had given himself up to covetousness, yet he still professed to be a servant of the Most High. He was not ignorant of God's work in behalf of Israel, and when the messengers from Balak announced their errand, he well knew that it was his duty to refuse the reward of Balak and to dismiss the ambassadors. But he ventured to dally with temptation and urged the messengers to tarry with him that night, declaring that he could give no decided answer till he had asked counsel of the Lord. Balaam knew that his curse could not harm Israel. The bribe of costly gifts and prospective exaltation excited his covetousness. He greedily accepted the offered treasures, and did not change his course when met by the angel. While professing strict obedience to the will of God, he tried to comply with the desire of Balak. If in reading this paragraph the word Balaam is replaced by the church, in the fourth and fifth centuries, and for Balak is read Constantine, or the Roman emperor, the exact history of the church is portrayed. The church had known God, but it became covetous, while it still professed allegiance to the Most High. The church, tempted by the rich offers of the government, parleyed with its ambassadors and refused to declare the statutes of Jehovah and remain a separate and peculiar people. The union of church and state was formed in order to obtain the privileges and protection of the civil power. The following paragraph, read in the same way, gives the second step in the transaction when church and state joined hands. Disappointed in his hopes of wealth and promotion, in disfavor with the king, and conscious that he had incurred the displeasure of God, Balaam returned to his self-chosen mission. After he had reached home, the controlling power of the Spirit of God left him, and his covetousness, which had been merely held in check, prevailed. He was willing to resort to any means to gain the reward promised by Balak. He immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them, Israel, the church, from God by enticing them into idolatry. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. The scheme was that Israel should be invited to a feast of the Moabites, where meats sacrificed to the heathen gods were eaten, and that Israel should be caused to commit adultery with the inhabitants of Moab. The church, between 312 and 538 A.D., joined hands with the civil power. It took of the wealth of the state and asked for civil protection. Then it was that the spiritual sins of idolatry and fornication were introduced. Idolatry was the love of money, the world, and all false worship which took the place of the worship of Jehovah. It is fornication in the eyes of God when His people are wedded to any power save the arm of omnipotence. If ancient Israel had remained true to the teachings of their leader, the temptations of the Moabites would have fallen on deaf ears. The same is true of the church, to which all this history is sent as an allegory. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, as described under the church of Ephesus, was a mingling of the pure teachings of Christ with the philosophy of the Greeks. If this doctrine had not been accepted in the church, 
which claimed to be following the Savior. If the children and the young people had been fed on truth, instead of the mixture of good and evil, as represented by the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the church would never have fallen. The message to Pergamus applies in the 4th and 5th centuries. It has also been the experience of each separate Protestant denomination, and it is a warning to all churches to the end of time. Any interpretation of this period that does not correspond with the history of Balaam is not according to the mind of the Lord. For God has given Balaam's history as a test by which we may know the true interpretation. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, which is the two-edged sword. From the midst of the church, which fell because of its union with the state, God separated by His Spirit a little company whose history may be read in a part of the message sent to the church of Thyatira. God calls to each church, no matter how low the ebb of spirituality, and those who have an ear turned heavenward hear, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. As the sins of the church of Pergamos are given in the form of a parable, so the blessings to the repentant ones of this period are offered in figure. Those who had in sin partaken of food offered to idols are offered in exchange the hidden manna. Manna is the bread of heaven, and as it was the only food necessary to nourish the multitudes of Israel during their forty years' journey, it became a fit emblem of Christ, the bread sent down to the world. Eating flesh sacrificed to idols brings death, but hidden manna brings life. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. A union of church and state crushes the spiritual life of any church. Why will men eat the food of idolatry when the bread of heaven is free to all? Why do Christians in the education of their children cultivate in them an appetite for food sacrificed to idols, instead of spreading the table with manna, which will give life to the soul? The lesson for the church as a whole is total separation from the civil power. The lesson to the home and to the individual is complete separation from the world. Cling to God, for He has the hidden manna. Feed the children on hidden manna, for it is well adapted to supply every need. God is teaching in these words a wonderful lesson on the laws of physical growth by simplicity of food, of mental growth by purity of food, food unadulterated with heathen teachings, and a spiritual lesson of marriage with the Lamb instead of with the dragon. The keen heart-searching of the Spirit, represented by the sword with a double edge, is shown in the second reward which is offered the repentant soul. To him is given a white stone, and in the stone a new name, which is known only to the one who receives it. As Zerubbabel was called a signet, or stone of sealing, represented as worn upon the hand of the Lord, so is each one who chooses to follow Christ in preference to the world. The stone is white, of dazzling purity. There are seen in it none of the tints which are admired by human eyes, but it is a stone free from all signs of impurity, and on it is impressed by the power of God, the name which is known only to the individual and his Redeemer. Others may pronounce that name, it is true, but its significance is a secret between Christ and the individual. The one who receives it has been guilty of idolatry and fornication, and none other save his Lord can know the soul experience which brought the new name. Once it was Jacob, supplanter. None but the bearer knew how applicable was the name. Every time it was pronounced by friend or foe, it was an open rebuke from God. 
and went at the close of the night of wrestling. The angel said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, a prince of God. None but Israel knew the depth of meaning in that new name. When the Jewish nation lived near to God, and the voice of Jehovah could be heard, every child was named under the direction of the Spirit. Today, heaven has a new name, carved on a pure white stone, for each sinner who repents, and the deeper the crimson dye of sin, the pure the stone will appear by contrast. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Thyatira The message to Pergamus carries ecclesiastical history to the year 538 A.D., at which time the union between civil and ecclesiastical power begun in the days of Constantine was consummated. During the period covered by Pergamus, the Spirit of the Lord was with the church as a church, but near the end of that period a separation began to take place. In the years following there was formed an organization still carrying the name of Christian, and another company, separating from that first organization, because of the practices of Balaam, the idolatry and fornication practiced by those who were once Christians indeed. Thus, improper education was the cause of the apostasy of the church, and the one sign of its fall was that, in its spiritual weakness, it sought the civil power for support. It is under these conditions that the message comes to the church of Thyatira. It is sent by the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Christ still walks among the candlesticks, but to Thyatira he comes with eyes like unto a flame of fire, to search the very hearts of those who profess to be his followers. To these he says, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. This was not an idle period, their works are thrice mentioned in the one list. Those who established a state religion, replacing paganism by the papacy, were most diligent workers. The church absorbed every government, every industry, all the educational institutions, everything. There was not a corner of Europe which was not under the direct inspection of that all-absorbing organization known as the papacy. Not only kings on their thrones, but every private individual in his own home was amenable to the power of Rome. The church stood between the king and his subjects. It stood between parents and children. It came between husband and wife. The secrets of men's hearts were open to the confessor. Works, works of all kinds were advocated, for the church taught that men were saved by works. Long pilgrimages across continents paid many a debt of sin. Penance and indulgences took bread from many a hungry mouth. The strongest government that ever bore sway was seated on the throne. Nevertheless, the masses thought that in their works for the church, their service, their charities, and their faith, they served the Christ. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. The sins imputed to the church of Pergamus are repeated in the message to Thyatira, but they are introduced by a different character. The woman Jezebel is taken as an object lesson. Jezebel was a Zidonian princess, a prophetess of the god Baal. Unlike Balaam, who before his fall worshipped the true God. Jezebel never made any pretensions of worshipping the Lord. Ahab, the king of Israel, married her for the sake of her influence, but found himself completely under the control of a headstrong, wicked woman. At her table in the kingdom of Israel sat the prophets of Baal. In the capital were erected temples, groves, and altars to the heathen god, Sun worship took the place of the worship of Jehovah. 
the prophets of God were put to death by order of the queen. Even Elijah fled before her face. She was a propagator of whoredom and witchcraft, and in the name of the king she wrote a letter causing innocent men to be put to death. Israel had war, bloodshed, and finally captivity as the result of the evil of this woman. It was during her lifetime that the heavens were stayed, so that it rained not for three years and a half. The history of Jezebel is an unerring guide to the interpretation of the prophetic history of the church during the Dark Ages. In every detail, even to this last period of years, the history of Jezebel is a parable of the church history during the time, times, and half a time, the three and one-half years of the papal supremacy, the period covered by the message to Thyatira. As a result of the doctrine of justification by works, which was the stronghold of the church during this period, Europe had over a thousand years of darkness, known in all history as the Dark Ages. It was a tyranny of the most absolute kind, a tyranny of theology over thought. Whosoever raised a hand against the church fell as did Naboth, whom Jezebel slew. Sorcery, witchcraft, idolatry, and fornication took the place of the religion of Jesus Christ. Antichrist, or the mystery of iniquity, had full control of the world. As Jezebel wrote in the king's name, and in his name slew an innocent man, so the apostate church opposed and exalted itself above the king of heaven. And while speaking in his name, it changed the law of Jehovah, and put to death thousands who were indeed followers of Christ. Jezebel had an opportunity to repent. So also had Ahab her husband, for there were many prophets in Israel, and the truth of God was taught. But the royal family were so under the control of the mother that there was no salvation for them. So God said of Thyatira, or the church of the Dark Ages, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. But as there was a day of recompense with Jezebel, so there will be with the oppressive power of the papacy. Jezebel was thrown from a window and dashed to pieces, and dogs ate her body. Ahab was slain, and dogs licked up his blood, and his sons were also killed. Of the mystery of iniquity it is recorded, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Herein is given the final destruction of the apostate church. The civil power of the papacy was broken in 1798, when Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner by the French. But the influence continues. Thyatira is Babylon itself, and the churches spoken of elsewhere as daughters of Babylon will meet with the fate of the mother Thyatira. For when the history of all churches is over, Babylon and her daughters will be destroyed in the lake of fire. The time of trouble spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 will be the time of tribulation for Thyatira. Of this the dreadful death of Jezebel is a symbol, as her life and deeds are taken to typify the church itself. Mention has already been made of a separation from the church, as a church in the days of Pergamos and the early days of Thyatira. Individuals who recognized the leadings of the Spirit gathered in little companies, hidden away in the caves, mountain fortresses, and dens, like the prophets of God in the days of Jezebel. In these secluded spots were thousands who did not bow the knee to Baal. Among these were the Waldenses of Italy, and others scattered all through Europe, who retained the word of God, and trusted in his promises. Of these scattered yet faithful ones, the message speaks in the following words, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine of Jezebel, 
and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak. I will put upon you none other burden. The name Thyatira means sacrifice of contrition, and appears to have direct application to those who in the eyes of their persecutors and the world were looked upon as heretics and outlaws, fit subjects for the stake. Their sacrifice was in truth a sacrifice of contrition. The contrite heart is the heart which God honors. As the ages passed, much of the light and truth which shone upon the apostolic church had been lost. But the Savior does not rebuke the ones who were sacrificing for the truth which they knew and lived out, because they did not have the light of the first centuries. Justification by faith was the doctrine which broke the power of the papacy. Christ and Him crucified, a truth so long forgotten, or replaced by faith in the head of the church, was given to the people of the world in the sixteenth century. Many other truths, long hidden by the darkness, or buried under the traditions of the church, were brought forward in the early days of the Reformation. The Sabbath of the Decalogue was acknowledged. Some preached upon the true meaning of baptism, and others made known the proper relation of the church to the state. But these subjects were too strong for minds so long held in subjection. The age was not ripe for the fullness of the truth. But as watchmen of the night hail the dawn when the morning star arises, so the early reformers, from Wycliffe to Luther and his contemporaries, opened the scriptures, and the first rays of light brought joy and gladness to those who sat in darkness. The very ones who saw the darkness break before the light of God's word saw also the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which was hung in the heavens. In 1780 the sun was darkened. This was the first of a series of celestial signs, and it was given to encourage those who had been oppressed.